people, rich people, poor people, and how they all kind of, as he lays these sheets one upon the other, they begin clustering around Jimmy Carter. And they're terrified because this guy is all things to all people. Well, that's a very good way to have a very ineffectual political uh, a policy, uh, uh, to, very ineffectual way to govern because suddenly you have to cash all those checks, right? And people are making demands on you. What does he really believe about abortion? You know, what does he believe, really believe about gays? What does he really believe uh, about um, um, how to wring out inflation, right? Uh, and, you know, and, and, and the other thing I'm gonna mention is um, why does Jimmy Carter lose? Yes, we all know, and I'm gonna say a, a very important reason why he didn't lose because it's very, very interesting and counterintuitive. We all know that America suffered a terrible economic ordeal, basically all through the 1970s. He, he comes in and it's not that terrible. Uh, inflation isn't that bad. Unemployment's like 6%. And of course, uh, inflation is up to like, you know, 10%. And um, his immediate instinct about handle, how to handle this problem is a tragic one. Uh, he basically borrows the conservative Republican idea that inflation is caused by big budgets, by government spending. And sometimes when I was writing about this, I literally cried. I cried twice when I was writing the book. Once when I was writing about Democrats and austerity, and once when I was writing about the assassination of Harvey Mill. And the tragic thing about this budget cutting hysteria, really, uh, two tragedies. One is that this idea that uh, closing budget deficits rings out inflation is completely contradicted by, by 40 years of subsequent history. Now we have virtually no inflation and massive budget deficits. So basically Carter is starving all these very necessary social programs for no good reason. And by the way, uh, uh, um, Stu Stuart Eisenstadt, his policy expert, wrote a thousand page book about the um, uh, Carter presidency and makes no apology. He doesn't revisit this at all. And then of course there's, hmm, Paul Volcker, who um, it deliberately induces a recession in order to wring out inflation, and, and, and Jimmy Carter backs him 100%. His advisors are begging him to distance himself politically from Paul Volcker, but he uh, absolutely refuses to do that. And this gets to, to this weird aspect of Jimmy Carter's character in which he finds sacrifice and austerity this profound moral virtue. And he's always calling on Americans to sacrifice. He's always saying, you know, our parents in World War II, look how they did without, and look how, you know, what wonderful effects that had. Now he's going up against a guy who's saying the way to solve inflation, the way to solve unemployment, the way to American, American, American economy grow is um, magic beans, supply side <laughs> economics, voodoo economics. I'm gonna give everybody, every human being in America who pays income taxes, a 30% tax cut. And not only am I gonna put money into your pocket, we're not gonna have to cut the budget because the economy is gonna grow so much. Um, of course, sometimes how can, he, it, how can he compete against that, right? So, that, that, theory, right? Yeah, so, so what are the Reagan Democrats? In part, they're people who are, you know, reacting against um, the association they make between liberals and African Americans, but they're also people who are literally getting nothing from Jimmy Carter. You know, Jimmy Carter turns his back on fighting for labor law reform when kind of corporate America goes four square against it. Now, let me add one more thing about why Jimmy Carter did not lose. If you ask 100 people on the street to say why, um, why Jimmy Carter lost in the 1980 election, well, probably 50 of them will say, who's Jimmy Carter? Um, <laughs> there was an election in 1980, but politically aware people, shall we say. And they'll say, well, of course, it's because Iran took a bunch of hostages and Jimmy Carter wasn't able to free them. Right. I, I sometimes very snarkily joke that there's like six or seven people, six or seven things that every person knows about a presidential election and each presidential election and three or four of them are probably wrong. Well, NBC and New York Times did a massive exit poll, something that had, you know, of, of size and scale that had never done, been done before. They literally interviewed 13,000 people. Why did you vote for president? What positions do you have? Uh, they asked them, what are their most important issues to vote on? The top three are economic. Number four is American prestige in the world. And, and, and Carter loses that one, right? Um, you know, those, the Soviets are invading Afghanistan, uh, et cetera. Uh, the fifth issue with 17% of voters, which is pretty high, their top issue, the reason that they're making their vote for president is the hostages in Iran. Of the 17% of the electorate who say that that's the most important issue, they choose Carter by a margin of two to one. 
Wow. So we can kind of take that one off the table and we wow. can ask the very hard question of why did that cliche, you know, uh, congeal uh, and you know, kind of become as hard as anodized steel. I don't have a good answer for that. Maybe it's just distracted from this economic uh, argument that you were talking about. And, well, and I mean, I think people were terrified of Ronald Reagan and that's a very important thing to remember. Right. Do you know, do you know what's uh, green and glows, David? <laughs> What's green and glow? This is my test to see if you read the last two pages of the book. <laughs> of course uh, I did. <laughs> I, ran, I ran 15 seconds after uh, Jimmy, after Ronald Reagan. So, so people are afraid so, that he's going to start another so, Vietnam or a nuclear so there was this, Which is a similar playbook to to what they did to Goldwater in in, yeah. in the six, in 64. But, but yeah, Carter didn't, didn't work. Did, yeah, yeah. But Carter was not effective with this playbook. Right. Because right. Uh, Ronald Reagan was so supple at communicating uh, that he was for peace. In fact, I talk about in the debate, uh, Ronald Reagan attacks Jimmy Carter from the left because Jimmy Carter says he's gonna, uh, he borrows an idea from one of the Republican candidates, uh, Senator uh, Howard Baker, that he's going to uh, uh, rise up a 50,000 troops mobile strike. Um, I don't know. If Ronald Reagan says, oh, well, you know, this is, this, he's, 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 he's a terrible militarist. So if you're going to vote for someone you're afraid of being a militarist, you know, you might as well vote for the militarist who's going to give you a 30% tax cut. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. I want to get back to some of this stuff uh, in a second uh, and, and, and also relate it to what we're seeing right now with uh, a, a presidential candidate uh, among the Democrats who wants to be all things to all people and create a popular front. Yeah. But uh, I want to bring, I want to do show and tell right now. Okay. Uh, because we found this in uh, my uh, cedar chest. This is from my aunt. It oh, is great. From the Women's Conference, National Women's Conference, November 1977. I believe she was there. Um, and that plays a, a pretty, uh, I, I was, uh, I didn't expect that to play such a big role in the early part of the book. Uh, but it's, it's sort of this undercurrent that you talk about throughout the book of uh, these social issues that are coming to the fore right. uh, in ways that uh, you know, are, are a little bit new. So could you talk about the women's conference and, and how this moment of uh, seemingly women's liberation was uh, sort of invaded upon and how that yeah. sort of represented all of these clashes on social issues throughout the, uh, throughout the this, 70s? This is, this is your aunt who might've attended this? Yes. How close are you to your aunt? My wife's aunt specifically. Uh, how close are you to her? Uh, well, she's passed now, but oh. um, she, uh, uh, you know, I don't think you could get the shirt anywhere else. Yeah, but, I don't uh, think, you, so you won't have an opportunity to ask her if she visited in the uh, display, convention display hall, uh, the, um, the booth <laughs> right. that was selling uh, vibrators and right. American blades, right? <laughs> so I, I, I say that. Fortunately, I'm unable to ask her that question. Yes. I say <laughs> that. Uh, to get to raise some eyebrows, but that actually has is a point that you know makes a point. Um, so there was a display hall. So basically, what this is is in 1975, the United Nations declares the International Women's Year, and there's a massive global conference in Mexico City, and American feminists are like, we should do a National Women's Conference. There hasn't been one since Seneca Falls, which of course was not you know, sponsored by the government. And they prevail upon Gerald Ford. And he's like, that's a great idea. So they, um, Congress authorizes almost unanimously a large amount, a yeah, small amount of money basically uh, for this conference that ends up being in November in, um, in Houston. And there are uh, state and local conferences to elect delegates. And uh, this becomes a galvanizing movement for the feminist movement. And they say this is a great opportunity to push the Equal Rights Amendment across that 38 state threshold. There's three, three, three states short. Jimmy Carter is a big ERA uh, supporter. Uh, he hires, and this is by the way, if you guys watch Mrs. America, a really good Hulu episode, they, they, they do a pretty decent job on this. Um, Jimmy Carter is for it. Uh, three uh, former first ladies all appear. Uh, and uh, they're like, 30 um, platform planks that are um, voted upon as kind of the, the will of American womanhood. It's, 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 again, one of these hubristic liberal things in which they basically, I show all these examples of all these feminists presuming that they can pass a resolution that the will of American womanhood is to pass the ERA, to uh, democratize access to abortion, uh, to have um, you know, textbooks that 
are, you know, have um, representation of, you know, women and minorities, and they, they don't even realize that there's going to be a backlash about this. In fact, um, one of the people who's leading um, the, 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 the bureaucracy to organize Mississippi's delegation has recently come back from Cuba, <laughs> where she was a guest of Fidel Castro. And of course, liberals, as usual, are completely blindsided, just like they're blindsided by, you know, Ronald Reagan, you know, beating, beating uh, Jimmy Carter in the debate. And um, basically, uh, it was a lot of fun to research and write about these two sides organizing and counter organizing and the absolute hair raising panic felt by women and of course men on the right uh, that this was basically a Satanist cabal. I mean, we joke about QAnon uh, and how this seems to come out of nowhere, but they're talking about Satan, right? I mean, they're talking about, um, they're talking about this being a Moscow plot, you know? And they, they're not, the, the, the right-wing women are not well organized enough to kind of take over the convention. So they decide they're gonna kind of have a counter event instead. Uh, and of course, Phyllis Schlafly, the great anti-ERA organizer is the spearhead of that. And um, to get to uh, my original question, there's also a, there's also a exhibit hall where people can pay like 50 bucks and get a booth. And after the thing is over, um, one of Phyllis Schlafly's uh, um, janissaries has the foresight to basically get a bunch of cardboard boxes and just scoop up posters and you know and some of the some you know sort of sex manuals that the feminists, by the way, suspect they bought some of them at, you know, at, at, at head shops, you know. <laughs> and um, Phyllis Schlafly turns this into a, um, a traveling, yeah. <laughs> traveling uh, circus exhibition. <laughs> uh, and and one, of, one of her organizers said, this was the best organizing tool I ever had, you know, in her efforts to kind of galvanize women to defeat the ERA. So again, the same dynamic of liberal hubris. In 1976, you know, time, instead of having a man of the year has women, American women. And there's a quote in the book in which uh, Time Magazine says, feminism has become such a you know, universally accepted part of American life that there's hardly any controversy anymore. And I point <laughs> out that at the same time they're saying this, and Time Magazine obviously is not the daily worker, right? Um, there are books literally selling in the, in the millions uh, that are basically marriage manuals for Christian women telling them that if they want a successful marriage and they want a happy life, they have to learn to more uh, submissively uh, be dominated by their husbands. You know, one of them advises them to dress up like little girls because men like feeling strong around little girls. Um, Jimmy Carter's sister, Ruth Stapleton, who's described as a faith healer, but really she's kind of a new age healer. She talks a lot about the inner child. She writes one of these books, The Gift of Inner Healing. And she says that you should practice, um, when your husband comes to the door, you should practice pretending he's Jesus Christ. So you don't kind of scowl when he comes in. You know, another one of these women, it's, it's Beverly LaHaye, whose husband, of course, writes the Left Behind books, uh, says that if your husband is speeding, you shouldn't tell him to stop speeding because that, that you know, violates Ephesians, you know, that says you have to submit your, to yourself to your husband like you would submit yourself to the Lord. You should pray for a policeman. So these sorts of pockets of reaction are what are being organized to create this particular pillar of the Reagan coalition. And that's part of the story of the book. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and, and it goes beyond the women's movement to uh, other parts of the-, the uh, Absolutely the murderous rage against gays. Again, I, I'm kind of like drawing the QAnon parallel. There's one of the preachers who's really big in this, kind of number two to Jerry Falwell, is this guy named James Robeson, who's very close to the Bush, Bush family. And he has a you know syndicated uh, TV, TV you know basically a religious TV show. And one day in uh, 1979, um, he says that um, he he quotes an article from the National Enquirer that gays are um, recruiting young boys and murdering them. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean it's straight up QAnon. And and so the 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 station that he records at in Fort Worth says, you keep on you know, insulting other religions, you know, you keep on, and, and, and the, the, the gays in Dallas demand equal time. And they're like, we can't handle this anymore. We're taking you off the air. And that becomes such, he becomes such an effective martyr around that, that a rally for, of 
15,000 people right around the time the moral majority starts, uh, takes place, in which basically people are rallying for his right to say that gay people are recruiting children in order to murder them. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, yeah, and you know, there are so many things as I was reading this book that were recurring sort of in, in uh, stories and issues on the right. The one that just came up on Friday, uh, this arrest of Steve Bannon yeah. over bilking supporters by stealing money out of this, this strange concept to build a wall privately, right. sort of the border wall. And, you know, you wrote this, this uh, very uh, influential uh, piece for the baffler called The Long Con about uh, uh, you know, right wing efforts to, to bilk supporters to, to right. use these various techniques. And that shows up, you know, in all of your books, really, yeah. but also in this one with, uh, you know, right wing mail order and, and, right. and Richard Vigory and all that yeah. stuff. Uh, the real scandal of that Baffler article is that every political reporter in America who covers the Republican Party and the conservative movement knew about this, too. But no one thought to write about it because it <laughs> has to be fair to the right. Right, right. So you finally sort of broke the seal on this. Yeah. And, and now we have the Justice Department suing somebody over exactly what you were talking about. Um, right. So talk about the origins of this and how, I mean, obviously the origins go way back even right. before this book, but how does it play into the development of the new right in, uh, in this time period? Yeah, I do tell the story in the book because I, I say, you know, the new right and the Christian right kind of thrives on these kind of uh, creation legends, you know, often they're, they're a little dubious, right? Um, but, you know, the story of Richard Vigory, who's one of the major characters in this book, uh, by developing direct mail techniques that, 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 that create upset, upset after upset in 76, 78, 1980, again, behind the back of the liberals. Um, his origin story is that he was working for Young Americans for Freedom, the, 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 the liberal group. He was um, he was the, he was mentored by a guy I call uh, the P.T. Barnum of the right, uh, Marvin Liebman, who turned against Vigory for being way too much of a scammer than he could even dream of. <laughs> and um, what Vigory does is, under the election laws in place at the time, in 1964, everyone who's given more than $50 to Barry Goldwater, their names are recorded, names and addresses are recorded in the office of the clerk of the House of Representatives for some reason. And see, so he hires, quote unquote, Kelly girls, which we now call temps, to right. basically go in there and start copying down names. Right. And before one of the bureaucrats is like, what the heck are you doing? Uh, you know, he has like something like 10,000 names. And that is, you know, that's, that's what he called the gold bricks of, 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 of the right wings Fort Knox, you know. And forevermore, all these you know, little old ladies on social security, just like they are now with the wall, are sending, you know, their little might uh, in response to these hair on fire fundraising levels. That, letters, that was Vigory's favorite part of the job, you know, talking about how um, uh, uh, a guy in a witch's outfit, you know, was burning the Bible in Boston, you know, uh, in protest <laughs> against Anita Bryant. And that's why you have to send Anita Bryant, you know, $10, $50, $100. Uh, <laughs> even um, in your own beloved Golden State, uh, Howard Jarvis, the guy who was the head of Proposition 13, uh, he, um, he had an organization, a front organization during the Goldwater campaign in which he solicited money for the Goldwater campaign and just took the money himself and then did it again in 1976 for Senator H. I. Hiawatha. Uh, so it keeps on happening and happening and happening. And as I say in the article, it's very hard to see where the money con begins and the ideological con ends because of course with something like you know voodoo economics with supply side economics you know it requires um uh you in gathering a multitude of fleeceable people including politicians in the case of supply side economics uh that provide sort of this ready pool of marks to you know kind of separate from their cash and also uh shall i say their liberty <laughs> <laughs> but it's so interesting because you know you have obviously these these figures on the right who are getting rich off of this this process but in in another sense uh they're they're also spreading the gospel like right. you know just the the act of getting this information out is sort of an end in itself 
right. and, and the money exactly. that they're it's, making it's, it's, uh, uh, yeah. It's, uh, they have their cake and eat it too. One of the things Vigory says to this stream of, of reporters who come calling, you know, as, as he becomes this public figure in the late 1970s, when they say, look at the statistics, you know, um, people are only making back 5% of what they invest in these, what they're shoveling to your firm. And he says, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. This is prospecting. You know, uh, we're creating publicity for them. We're creating a mailing list that allows us to further spread the, the gospel. This is advertising. He's completely without shame when it comes to this stuff. So he's, in, in a sense, it's true. He's becoming rich. And he's also, you know, effectively persuading, you know, millions of Americans that, uh, you know, uh, George McGovern is in league with Satanists. And you know, robbing of him of his uh, Senate seat in 1980. Exactly, exactly. Uh, that's great. Uh, so um, we should probably, since the book is called Reagan Land, talk a little bit more about Reagan. Uh, mm -hmm. So in 1976, it's another classic Pearlstein line. Uh, it says, like, Reagan, there's no way that he could ever be a serious presidential candidate again. He's too old, which is kind Richard of Richard Nixon has a better chance of winning in 1980 than Ronald Reagan. <laughs> There you go. He's, he's, he's considered too old, which is hilarious now, considering who we have running. Um, uh, and, and he does some very specific things, similar actually to what Nixon does in, in different ways, mm -hmm. to prepare himself for right. the 1980 election. This, this speaking tour, this like right. huge speaking tour, uh, right. 250 dates a year and stuff like right. that. Talk about how Reagan sort of prepared the ground in that uh, four year period. Well, the speaking tour is both political, right? I mean, he's preparing for, for, um, for 1980, but it's also how he makes a living. He charges $5,000 a ch uh, speech. There's a, kind of an expose in the Washington Post, you know, that he, he charged $7,000 to the Boy Scouts. You know, he, give, <laughs> this, you know, he gives Republican groups, you know, a discount. They only have to pay, you know, you know $2,500. Right. But, you know, in the bowels of his archives, there's just like, these schedules and these incredibly meticulous advanced manuals about you know exactly how high the podium has to be and exactly how the lighting has to be and who's allowed in and who's not allowed in. Um, but the guy who's um, masterminding uh, his kind of pre-campaign uh, before he announces is his campaign manager from 1976, a guy named John Sears, who the right despises. He's seen as a, as a non-ideological sellout. Um, that's a fun, uh, fun, you know, kind of uh, uh, digression we could go into. He had a little tippling problem. But uh, John Sears was a young, shrewd lawyer who uh, worked for Richard Nixon's firm in the middle of the 1960s and, and, and Richard Nixon immediately spots him as <laughs> someone with Nixonian abilities, right? <laughs> and um, so in 1966, when Richard Nixon is coming back from his you know, humiliating loss for governor in 1962 and his humiliating stealth campaign to be drafted in 1964, you know, he decides that he's gonna basically give speeches for anyone who invites him, any Republican candidate for the 1966 um, off your elections. And that was a Republican year. So he's able to kind of take credit rightly or wrongly for all these victories. And so that's what John Sears does for Ronald Reagan. Uh, so in 1978, he does this massive tour, uh, including uh, for um, a liberal Republican. I would say like, you know, half the letters that Ronald Reagan dictates uh, to fans or former fans are him uh, defending himself for having given a campaign speeches for this one liberal Republican, Charles Percy of Illinois, who, you know, uh, supported the Pan Panama Canal treaties and supported ERA and supported abortion. Uh, but, um, you know, he's doing what Richard Nixon did. He's, he's collecting chits. You know, he, he does, you know, I have scripts for hundreds of uh, TV commercials that he does, including for, you know, Dick Cheney, you know, for people down to the county commissioner. And he's building a machine. And he's also um, using these new election laws. So one of the great, fun, strange, uh, you know, like neoconservatives love talking about unintended consequences. One of the unintended consequences that really shapes the history of this period is the post-Watergate campaign finance laws. Uh, in which they come up with these things called, they, they actually expand, they existed, uh, political action committees. And this idea that if we have 
if groups can basically get involved in politics but not get around involved directly in campaigns, that will increase the amount of Americans who participate in politics. That will increase democracy. Uh, the model is basically the AFL-CIO who uses political action committees because it's illegal for unions to give money to campaigns to pool donations from members. And lo and behold, uh, corporations and right-wing ideological groups are the people who take advantage of this uh, completely in, 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 in exactly the opposite uh, way that they were intended. So there's the National Conservative uh, political, uh, National Conservative Political Action Committee run by a guy, and I, I, I for some reason, I, I can't remember his name. He, he died of AIDS, of course, five years after this, after, um, you know, um, coming, 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 you know, raising high in the new right, this anti-gay movement. But um, they come up with this idea in 1980 that they're going to run commercials against incumbent liberal Democratic senators on a hit list, including people like, you know, George McGovern and uh, Birch Bayh and, you know, uh, uh, um, especially um, um, Frank Church, especially in small states. There's literally a memo which they're like, you can buy an ad, you know, in prime time in, in Fargo, North Dakota for like $500. In Houston, it would be, you know, $5,000 uh, in which they run cop cookie cutter uh, commercials uh, calling these guys, um, you know, stealth ultra liberals who are being, you know, having their strings being pulled by, you know, bankers in New York. And they do this like a year and a half before the election. And no one has, you know, ever done anything like this before. They're just completely degrading uh, the approval ratings of these candidates like a year and a half before it happens. And these are kind of the same people who are associated with Richard Figury. You know, they're making money hand over fist. They're completely dirtying the political process. Uh, the guy in charge of NICPAC, the National Conservative Political Action Committee says, the great thing about what we're doing is the candidate we're supporting, uh, uh, we can lie through our teeth. He says, quote unquote, we can lie through our teeth and the candidate we're supporting stays clean. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, that, that works. And uh, by the way, um, Kathleen Hall Jameson's uh, research uh, in packaging the presidency, she found something like there was like $5,000 spent in independent expenditure committees for Jimmy Carter uh, in 1980, but something like you know, 10 million for Ronald Reagan. Right. Amazing. Um, I have a couple more questions then. I'm, I'm gonna try to get to questions from, um, from the audience. Uh, if you wanna put those in the chat, go ahead. Um, so, uh, you know, you, we, we talked a little bit about the sort of backlash uh, on social issues, but there was another backlash happening around this time that you write about in the book uh, in the corporate boardroom. Yeah. And, and you, you, you call them the boardroom Jacobins. Right. Uh, and uh, I want you to talk about this, this change in orientation where, where corporate America finally uh, decided to become more of a political force. Right. So this all comes from a wonderful monograph called Fluctuating Fortunes and the History of American Business and Politics by a professor at Berkeley named David Vogel. You can read about it in Hacker Pearson. I kind of synthesize a lot of this stuff. Um, but um, basically during kind of like what, what the French call the Trente Glorieuses, you know, the 30 years of American, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Western economic boom after World War II. Right. Um, in which basically all you have to do is, you know, kind of, if you're a CEO, CEO show up for work and you're kind of guaranteed, you know, steadily mounting profits. Um, it really is the case that big business, and I'm talking about the blue chip Fortune 500 companies, uh, buy into uh, things like the Great Society. You know, I found an article in the Harvard Business Review talking about how important it was to, you know, for, for CEOs to give all their support to Lyndon Johnson after the Watts riots, right? Uh, you know, there's, there's, of course, the famous Labor Management Accord after the, you know, Treaty of Detroit in 1955, in which GM kind of uh, gives its workers, you know, uh, the first you know, pensions and health care in exchange for uh, Walter Ruther promising no wildcat strikes. Uh, and um, there's another group of businessmen, the kind of people I write who supported Barry Goldwater in 1964, who consider this, considers Walter Ruther, you know, next to Stalin, right? And are completely uh, feel victimized by the fact that big business, uh, the Rockefellers of the world are buying into liberalism. Uh, and corporate lobbying during this period um, 
is just absolutely atrocious. It's zero sum lobbying. It's like Pratt and Whitney, you know, hiring a lobbyist to get the engine contract from, you know, uh, Boeing, right? Uh, there's no lobbying going on that represents the interests of business as a class. But what happens in the mid 70s as profits start flattening and, uh, and then, you know, kind of stagnating because of the Arab oil embargo and because of, you know, labor contracts and things like that, uh, I say that business becomes class conscious. Uh, and I think any loyal reader of the American Prospect, you know, you read your Hacker and Pearson, and you, you know, you know the story. I'm just kind of Hacker's giving, on a board, actually. So yeah, there you go. So I'm just kind of, you know, giving kind of a, a really kind of snappy kind of narrative version of this. But you know, there's literally one meeting, the Business Roundtable, uh, um, which is the organization that you have to be a CEO to join. It's all you know, GM, GE, you know, Pratt and Whitney, you know, Gulf and Western, this big business. The board uh, literally works with the Carter administration to write a labor reform bill to make it harder to fire people uh, if they organize a union. And uh, this is in the interest of most of these companies because the people who are uh, using these loopholes to, to break their unions, you know, really are their competition. Mm -hmm. And these are consumer facing companies. They have brands to worry about. And uh, the CEO of Sears is retiring and he makes this impassioned speech at their board meeting saying, no, we have to join these Neanderthal corporations <laughs> and join their coalition to break the back of this labor law. And right. uh, it's one of like three or four lobbying, corporate lobbying campaigns I describe in the book that are together like the most aggressive lobbying campaigns that Washington has ever seen. I have a scene in which the, the, the congressional mailroom is complaining that they're, they usually use like three or four carts a day to kind of like, you know, wheel the mail to the congressional offices, but now they have to use like nine or 10, you know, <laughs> and then um, people are complaining that all these automated messages because people are beginning to use mainframe computers and in, in, in politics uh, that they're literally sending automated message messages in response to you know automated messages they're getting from stockholders and companies but the long and the short of it is uh, corporate America becomes this united force uh, by the 1980 election uh, to um, basically withdraw their consent from um, from the liberal consensus. So this is the kind of stuff, you know, any any decent Marxist account of, you know, our, our you know, like David Harvey or anything like that, you know, this is this is really the ascendancy of neoliberalism. But if you want to know the characters involved, and some of them are quite colorful, uh, one of them is the first guy to have a car phone, uh, you know, this is the book for you. Very good. Um, and, you know, so, so like, you know, just to give you one statistic, you know, by uh, 19, 78, and this is way before, you know, Reagan's, you know, 1980 campaign, um, there's a poll that like something like 64% of the public supports the idea of lower corporate taxes because they've become so convinced by this propaganda campaign. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Uh, and, and in some ways, a, uh, a direct assault on, on Ralph Nader and consumerism. Direct assault on Ralph Nader, who, by the way, is a hero in the book. So, you know, if you want to, <laughs> you know, you if you want to recover Ralph Nader, I explain why uh, well, he, you know, co-starred on Saturday Night Live and, you right. know, all that stuff. Yeah. Well, what's amazing is how many people that are still at the center of our politics are, are in this book. You know, of course, Joe Biden is mentioned several times in the book. Uh, Donald Trump gets uh, a couple cameos. Uh, uh, Biden, Democrat one, Donald Trump. Democrat Donald Trump. One of the things, uh, and, and maybe Republican Joe Biden, if you read this, this quote, <laughs> Um, uh, we're talking about Humphrey Hawkins, and he says that Hubert Humphrey wasn't cognizant of the limited, finite ability government has to deal with people's problems. Yeah, I love um, that I mentioned that the, the, the writing about democratic austerity is the only thing that made me cry, you know, besides. Exactly. exactly. So, I mean, you know, it, it is so interesting that they're, they're still obviously uh, 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 defining this, this era of politics, this, uh, in many ways, this kind of uh, uh, the, 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 the things you document in, in Reagan land uh, still are ever present. Uh, what uh, do you think that uh, we are ready to leave Reagan land finally? I mean, like, the, 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 are, are we- Are you doing it too? <laughs> no. Uh, I, are we ready to finally get, break out of this very tight cloister around our politics that uh, seeks, seeks to define the parameters 
right. you know, I mean, we've seen some some hopeful signs of that in 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 recent years, but also, you know, the rise of Trump just sort of blows everything up and 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 makes an entirely new paradigm, which is not altogether good. So, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I would not be supporting my case in any way if I didn't say anything other than, you know, who knows. Uh, I mean, on the one hand, of course, we have this, you know, remarkable upsurgence of sensitivity around racial issues. That's absolutely stupendous. You know, we have, um, you know, Joe Biden, obviously very far to the right to his reelection campaign in 1978, in which he bragged that he was the stingiest senator, you know, and, and you know, bragged that to he the was- left, To the left of his campaign, yeah. yeah. Yes, to he's the left, the left right, right. Uh, yeah. But, you know, one of the things I, you know, um, tweeted during the convention was, and this goes to your work, you know, was there a single word about, you know, something like uh, the world of private equity, you know, taking it upon themselves themselves to literally reorganize massive sectors of the entire economy? And, you know, basically, you know, uh, Matt Stoller calls private equity a political movement, right? I mean, it's right. literally this world in which, yes, we giggle, uh, this world in which um, these folks are kind of um, devolving to themselves the power to decide what kind of society we have in places like, you know, uh, rural Wisconsin. And mm -hmm. there's just no, there's no um, discourse about that within, you know, the people who put together, you know, the Democratic Convention. So I guess my answer to that one is, um, you know, it's up to us. It's, right. it's up to the, yeah. you know, the people in the Zoom room and the people <laughs> we're, we're trying to influence uh, to, you know, uh, make them do it. I have sort of a follow up on that uh, from the, the comments. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at some reader questions here, listener questions. Uh, despite repeated failures and, and pillaging by conservative administrations, they always seem to eventually come back into power. And this, this commenter wants to know why that is. Is it political skill, lust for power, or political malpractice by liberals who, who try and fail to counter them. What, well, I mean, I mean look, I, it's easier to win if you don't have any scruples. I mean, obviously <laughs> it's easier to win if you uh, are willing to, you know, uh, without, without compunction, uh, aim at the lowest, you know, kind of lowest, most fundamental lizard-like, you know, functions of the human brain, right? I mean, right. that's an automatic advantage, right? Uh, I think that the fact uh, that, you know, the media uh, will always, since there are two political parties and each political party will have a position on every issue, will give uh, the utterances of both parties equal weight. It, that obviously structurally advantages the side that's willing to lie. You know, I, mm -hmm. document, I document that in 1980, the, the but her emails of the 1980 election was Billy <laughs> Gate, which the White House was completely innocent. The, the New York Times ran 50 articles on it in a month, but, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't criticize. Billy Gate, this is about Billy, this is about the president's brother, Billy Carter. Yeah, yeah the president's probably. brother, Billy Carter, was taking money hand over right. fist from the Libyan government. Right. Uh, the White House had nothing to do with it, but um, it's really striking. Uh, the the Republicans in the last days of the election were kind of mow mowing the press into reporting this FBI investigation. It really, really strikingly resembles what happens in the closing days of the nineteen the twenty sixteen election. Uh, and yes, and there's a certain sort of fecklessness that's afoot in uh, the Democratic Party uh, that I don't need to uh, uh, dwell on. Those guys have it hard enough. We'll, 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 we'll say pas d'enemy de, de droit right now in the Democratic Party and leave it at that. <laughs> there you go. Um, I have another question from the, from the comments uh, that talks about uh, this, this moment regarding the 1980 debates and mm -hmm. sometimes called debate gate. Uh, right. And the question that, that the individual has is, uh, what was the role of James Baker in that and the story of behind his appointment as chief of staff? Well, I mean, the, the story of his appointment as chief of staff was he was good at, you know, handling Ronald Reagan at a time when the, the, the administration goes out the rails. You don't have to see anything nefarious about that. But James Baker was, was in charge of the debate preparations, which uh, were very, very, very seriously done. Uh, they, they put together a full-size studio in the garage of this mansion that the Reagan administration had rented that, by the way, John F. Kennedy had, had built in Virginia. And um, huh. they pilfered a copy of Jimmy Carter's foreign policy briefing book. I don't have a problem beating up on the mainstream political press because they have a lot to answer for. In this particular instance, the guy who played Jimmy Carter in the practice rounds was uh, uh, David Stockman, 
the young congressman who you know was a supply side congressman who became the budget director and uh he gave a speech back home in michigan to his constituents in a small town and he said by the way i've spent the whole week pretending to be Jimmy Carter. And I had, by the way, I had, uh, a, uh, I had a script. I had, you know, the briefing book that I was, that I was able to, you know, uh, get my lines from. And this revelation <laughs> appeared in exactly one newspaper in the United States, right. in Elkhart, Indiana. <laughs> and ABC News uh, hired George Will uh, yeah. to be the debate commentator. And he was actually at those debate practice sessions helping, saw the Pilford briefing book. And by the way, on, uh, on the night of the debate, talked about what a great, 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 um, great job Ronald Reagan had done um, uh, without revealing anything of his role. Uh, so, I mean, it's not really determinative. I think Ronald Reagan would have done just fine anyway. He had, he had already kind of burnished his foreign policy answers to a sheen, you know, talking about what a great uh, fan of peace he was. Um, but, um, you know, the fact that um, you didn't have to cheat to win doesn't mean you didn't cheat. And there's no question that they cheated yeah. and there were no consequences whatsoever. Absolutely. Um, we only have a couple minutes left. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention with, uh, with the sort of eternal recurrence is that today, Joe Biden put out a series, a list of Republicans for Biden that right. uh, have endorsed him. And one of them was Gordon Humphrey. Uh, oh, who plays, one a, of my friends. Yeah. <laughs> plays a, a, a big role as one of the, the new right victors in, in 1978. Yes, uh, he's, he's an early never Trumper. Uh, he was an airline <laughs> pilot and he kind of came out of nowhere. He was the head of the running uh, uh, the campaign against the Panama Canal in New Hampshire. And uh, he was drafted by the crazy newspaper publisher there. And yeah. Maybe we should briefly talk helpful. about as our final question, the Panama Canal, because it, it you know, Looking back in retrospect, we don't think about the Panama Canal Treaty as, as yeah. in any way some sort of political hinge point in American history. But you talk about how this was really a, a, a rallying moment on the right. It was something that really galvanized them. So yeah, it was really this proxy debate. Yeah, it was really a proxy debate about sort of Americans' foreign policy after World War, after Vietnam. Right. Jimmy Carter um, continued negotiations that had been ongoing since... Uh, Lyndon Johnson after there were riots in the canal zone to, to, to return the canal. And they basically, it was very much this, this thing that was supported by everyone in the foreign establishment, foreign policy establishment, but it really kind of reached its day, it reached its apogee uh, in um, late 1977 and 1978. And once the new right got wind of this, they decided this was the the best organizing opportunity they had. They harvested millions of names and millions of dollars behind this. But the idea was that uh, it was an issue that uh, Ronald Reagan had brought up on the campaign trail in his primary campaign in 1976, that there is no Panama Canal. There's an American canal in Panama. It's just as, as much as a, a, a part of America as Texas and Alaska. And uh, Panama was run by a, a, a Marxist dictator. It wasn't, right? And uh, they said it was, you know, that basically these, these brown people couldn't possibly run this complicated thing. It was one of uh, uh, Jimmy Carter's um, great congressional successes. He expended an enormous amount of political capital, which uh, really kind of screwed him when he tried to get the SALT II treaty through. Um, but you know, the, the moral of that story is the canal did pass over to Panama in 2000. Uh, it's run without a hitch. Every you know, panicked, you know, uh, uh, absurd claim that the, about the right was uh, completely false, except for that there was this guy to watch who was really scary named Manuel Noriega. You know? right, 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 right. Uh, but well, that was a um, typical example of a you know, kind of right wing sort of um, a paranoid lunatic campaign that had a very strong elements of anti-Semitism, by the way, the idea that the Rockefellers and Jewish bankers were, um, were behind mm. this whole scam and scheme. Interesting. Well, uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, the book is Reaganland, America's Right Turn, 1976 to 1980. The, uh, this is the fourth in a series, uh, a monumental series uh, that starts with uh, Barry Goldwater and, and Before the Storm and goes through Nixon Land and the Invisible Bridge and now this. Uh, thank you so much for, for, uh, for this in, uh, tremendous uh, and important work. And uh, thank you for being here. Well, if anyone wants to follow up with questions, nixonland at gmail.com. I take all comers and uh, glad to have you aboard. Cheers.